So welcome everybody and, and thanks for coming to our BCIT GIS uh, information uh, seminar that we're having here online today. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, my name is Carl Kaparczyk. I'm the program head uh, as well as one of the instructors in the program. And uh, we have uh, in the background to answer questions is Sheila Churchill. So she's another uh, uh, instructor in our program. So while I'm talking, uh, if there are any questions that you might have along the way, you can always type in the chat area uh, to Sheila and uh, Sheila will uh, try to answer them. If there's something that she can't get, then we might wait till uh, the end and uh, there'll be hopefully a little bit of time that we can do some uh, uh, questions and answers uh, together over, over the audio. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about um, We've got uh, three programs, Advanced Diploma, Bachelor of Technology, and our Advanced Certificates. So let's uh, get into it. Okay, so what am I going to cover uh, this evening? Uh, first, I thought I'd, uh, I did a, a recording uh, of two of our graduates. One's in a government agency, provincial government, uh, BC government, and the other is in a uh, private company. So uh, letting them tell you what they got out of the program and what they're doing now. So uh, that's sort of to start off quite quickly. Uh, then I'll get into sort of the GIS is everywhere, you know, how it can be used, then get into what kinds of careers. I know some of you might not know that much about GIS. So uh, give you some ideas of different types of uh, careers that you can have. Uh, with GIS, we'll also talk about money. I know people wonder, well, how much am I going to make um, as a GIS technician or as a GIS manager? Uh, we'll then go into the GIS program at BCIT, and I'll do uh, an overview of, again, our advanced diploma, Bachelor of Technology, and our advanced certificate. And then uh, at the very end, we'll have uh, some uh, questions and answers if there are any. So let me start off first to go to a video that I have for our first speak, um, first graduate. Uh, this person, his name is Michael Simon, and he works for a company uh, called Tetran. So I'll let him talk uh, about uh, his experience and what it's brought to him. I graduated from the BCIT GIS program in 1995. I entered the program after uh, graduating from my post my grad undergraduate in geography from the University of Western Ontario. I really wanted to advance my skill sets in GIS and contemplated uh, going for my master's, um, which would have been a great decision, but I think the shortcoming is I would have learned a lot of the theory but not had a way to practically apply it. So I sought out BCIT as a, a GIS program and it was exactly what I expected. I got hands-on uh, knowledge and theory together with the opportunity to work for, uh, for an industry partner through a co-op program. Um, I was hired almost directly out of the program and I think that coming to BCIT for GIS was really a, a critical point a success point in my life. Um, it really opened the door to where I am today and we uh, have hired five students from the BCIT program through the practicum uh, internship opportunity over the last four years. Graduating from a GIS program at BCIT, um, getting a first job with the provincial government in 99 in November. Basically, I graduated. I my program was uh, I, I started in 98, May 98. I came from uh, from Germany at that time. I just landed as an immigrant here to Canada, so it was all new actually, new country, new program, 
everything coming together, adjusting to the life here. So I started in May 98. Actually, no, it's in September 98 I started and I graduated in 99. The program was very intensive. I did not have the luxury to take some prep courses in programming and I didn't realize how much programming it will in involve. But I think uh, I got a lot of help actually. People were very helpful. All the students, you know, they work together. It's a very collaborative environment. And the teachers are also very supportive. So, you know, um, for example, I didn't have a computer and the, I didn't know that assignments have to be submitted. You type it up and then you have to submit it and type up. I just wrote it in hand and submitted it and it was not accepted. So that was my first lesson. You need to, <laughs> you need to uh, adopt to the two, uh, adopt basically the tools and technology which is required to do, to, to do your coursework. Anyways, I graduated in 98. My first job was in, Nanaim, in, in Nelson, which is almost 1,000 kilometers from here. So that was a four-month term. It was a GIS technician. And from there, once you're in the organization, people know you, your capabilities, your skills, you know, networking help, you establish those networks. As I said to you earlier, there are eight different offices. So they were looking for somebody in Surrey at that time. C2 Sky land use plan, which this map is uh, from, it is from November 27, 2001 actually, and I'll speak to that in a bit. So when I was in Nelson, they were looking for somebody in Surrey office, and that's, uh, and I am from Surrey, I wanted to come back. So I landed a job here, that was a one year term position. And uh, all, it evolved into a permanent position. It was a GIS analyst position, I was an analyst for about three, four years, and then I became a GIS coordinator I was in coordinator position for about four years, and then I became GIS managers, and I've been in managers since uh, then, basically eight years now, nine years. So it is an ev evolution from a technician to a manager over the course of last 17 years. And I think the program at BCIT really gave me a solid foundation, not only in the technical aspects, but also things like project management, communication, um, presentation, how to present, and also networking opportunities. For example, I learned through the GIS program that you know you need to become member, student member, for example, for some um, GIS organizations like uh, Urban and Regional Information Systems uh, Association. It has a URISA, which we call. URISA has a local chapter, and I joined. And I still remember there was only four people at that point on the executive, and I was one of the youngest one, a student member. And I think, and I, I remained part of that organization for the last uh, 15 years. And it was immensely helpful. I get, in, get to know all the GIS managers across uh, the lower mainland. So that's my brief, in, in nutshell, my history, you know, in terms of how I took the program and where I am now. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And I, when I look back, it may sound really challenging and hard, but I think it is worth it to go through that rigor rigorous training. So uh, we're going to move on to the GIS is everywhere section here now. Uh, normally we have these sessions uh, at BCIT, so I would have uh, mentioned, you know, some of you could have uh, gone on to Google, uh, Google Maps, and uh, typed in where you are and how do I get to BCIT? And Google would come up and give you the fastest route. So uh, one of these Google Maps, uh, it is a type of GIS. It's a very simple one, uh, but it just gives you an idea that sort of GIS is getting embedded everywhere. Um, and as well as you know, having sort of traditional maps uh, with GIS, we're also dig um, uh, dealing with uh, imagery. This is, say, an aerial photo over the BCIT Burnaby campus. But we also work with things um, such as uh, satellite uh, images. So we can have very detailed data from air photos as well as very sort of global coverage from satellites that you all get to, uh, to learn about in our program. Lots of different applications for uh, GIS. So again, the big thing, you know, why are we doing this virtual COVID-19? And uh, you've probably seen a COVID-19 map that's by John Hopkins University or some other place from around the world. I've got a, uh, 
uh, COVID-19 cases worldwide. Uh, that's from John, Hop John Hopkins uh, University. It was from about a week ago, so the, the numbers there might be a little bit different. Uh, so we do, you know, do all kinds of things with GIS. Uh, the uh, little graphic above was the H1N1. So, um, you know, that uh, shows that we were using GIS back then as well for um, epidemiology. Other applications, there's um, in the policing. So trying to figure out, you know, uh, where are hot spots for crime or if somebody is doing crimes to help create a geographic profile. So um, the police can try to predict areas where this person might do their next crime so that they're better able uh, to catch him or her. Uh, the web is very big. Um, so again, I mentioned uh, Google. So I've got here on the, the bottom left-hand corner under web applications. Uh, we're now seeing maps uh, in perspective views and in 3D views. Uh, here's a, an area in Seattle, uh, CenturyLink Field. So if you've ever gone to watch uh, a soccer game, this is where you would have uh, gone and done it. Uh, we also have the, the, uh, the interactive web map that's on the right. Quebec Photo Radars, this is called a story map. Uh, it's becoming very popular. It's made by um, a company called ESRI. So ESRI makes software called ArcGIS, where they have a whole suite of software that are um, called uh, Arc, say ArcGIS Desktop and Professional, <clears throat> sorry, Professional and um, Online and a few others. So this is one of ESRI's products uh, that they make story maps. So the nice thing is it's very easy in some cases to make sort of interactive web mapping applications. And this one, they provide you with a base map and you can put little push pins um, in the map and uh, to each push pin you can connect uh, video or um, a digital photograph. And this one, it looks like this digital photograph. So um, it's getting popular that, you know, um, people with very little experience can start sort of generating these what we call mashups. But uh, what we can provide to you is sort of more in-depth technical knowledge in this. But this is just sort of, you know, to give you an idea of, of things that are happening right now. Um, all different government agencies from um, federal government, provincial government, municipal government, um, they're all using uh, GIS. This is an example that I have here. It's called the Cosmos system. It's from the city uh, of Surrey here in the lower, ma lower mainland of Vancouver. And um, what I wanted to show you uh, in their Cosmo system is so we're taking a look, we can see individual lots, uh, say here on 145th Street and 59B Avenue. And um, there's the, uh, along with the, uh, the lot outline, we also have the building footprint and the address number. So I've clicked on the 5987 uh, in Cosmos and it opens up an information panel on the left hand side of the screen. So it gives you information such as what is the address, what's the um, property identification, what's the legal description, um, say what year was it built, what were say the last uh, five years, what was the assessed value, and a bunch of other things uh, in there. Um, what I'm tr wanting to point out to you here is in GIS, you might just see the map, but associated with each object in that map in the GIS, there is one or more databases of information uh, connected to it. So for this one, um, it looks like, you know, there's this one long list of information, but that can be pulled from two or three or more different databases. So that's a really cool thing with uh, GIS is we can start linking multiple databases together with our um, spatial data uh, to come up with sort of new information um, that we might not have uh, easily been able to access before. Um, so GIS is everywhere. It's, it's, there's sort of a lot of different ways that you can look at uh, GIS. Uh, it is a tool, is a toolbox. If I want to do uh, a buffer or measure a distance or something like that, it's, it's like a tool. You can take out a, like a hammer or saw and do something. So uh, it's also a, a, a technology because it's being 
it's a computer uh, derived software. There is that technology behind it, uh, as well as it's a science. So um, it's based on, on geography and geographic principles, um, spatial science. Uh, and from that, you can say, well, it, it can help you make decisions. So it can be a decision support system. So say for the city of Surrey, uh, in order for them to help figure out, you know, where am I going to, or which streets need paving for uh, next year. Uh, you can have the GIS help you to do that. Um, and again, it's becoming mainstream everywhere. Say it's in, like I said, it's in Google Maps. Uh, you might have used it if you were to, you know, have to drive over to BCIT today to see this presentation. A little bit about careers. Uh, so GIS is used both in the private sector and the public sector. I was mentioning all different levels of government make use of it, um, as well as businesses, small businesses, up to very large ones. So I've got a few um, logos here from different agencies that you might recognize. So again, um, the federal government, so Natural Resources Canada uses it. Uh, we have on the left-hand side here, the city of Burnaby, um, as well as uh, we have Whistler here, um, some private enterprises, so a, um, engineering company, Kerwood Lytle. Hatfield Consultants is an environmental uh, engineering company. We have a mining company. Um, Lafarge is a big company that, uh, uh, that does concrete. We've got um, retail things as well. Boston Pizza, Chipotle, uh, McDonald's, and that's just, this is just a small sliver. So um, getting that GIS career, like you can sort of move between all of these different types uh, of companies, you're not uh, pigeonholed into one. GIS skills are transferable across, um, again, private, public sector, big companies, small companies. Okay, and again, just because if, there's probably some of you that don't uh, know that much about GIS and like, should I be getting into it? Uh, the next couple of slides, I just talk about a few different uh, applications. Uh, so if you are an engineer, uh, for example, and you want to um, or say, well, what can an engineer do with GIS? Because some people already might have a, uh, uh, an engineering degree, say from uh, UBC. You say, well, should I get into GIS? Well, yeah, there's lots of things that GIS can help with. So things like planning and site selection. So uh, if you're an engineer and uh, you're tasked with, okay, well, where's the best place to put a uh, a bridge across a river, or um, what is the uh, um, a route that will, uh, say if you have to put in a new road uh, to go to um, a, a mine site, say if you're an engineer doing some work for a mining company. So the mining company needs a road built to it. So you as the engineer have to figure out, you know, what's the route that, uh, say is the shortest distance, it doesn't go down, very steep slopes. I might also look at the environmental aspect. So is there um, um, habitat that uh, you're not allowed to uh, um, put roads on and things like that. So there's lots of different things that you can do with the GIS as the engineer. Um, we have GIS uh, data collection devices. So uh, there's a uh, sort of a, a smart pad, but it could also be uh, on a phone. So um, there are GIS apps to help you collect data. You can then bring that data in um, as the engineer, feed it into all of your other layers of information in order to come up with, okay, well, this is our route, or this is the location, the best location uh, to put a bridge uh, across the river. And then what happens after the engineer builds something, so it's, it's done, um, somebody needs to take care of it, needs to manage those assets, and again, uh, with GIS, that's one of the things that you can do. So you can say, well, we've built this road. We need to monitor it over time for potholes and other things cracking on the road and figuring out, you know, which parts of the road need um, fixing. So there's lots of things you can do with GIS um, as an engineer in the, the sort of investigation, the building, and then the management. Okay, move to my next slide here. Okay, uh, municipal. So municipal planners, 
Um, they can do things you might have seen uh, if you've gone to a community um, design or planning meeting. There'll be some big boards um, and it shows you what say a new park is going to look like or a new development that the city planners want. So you as the planner, you could be using uh, GIS, you can use GIS to build those models so that people ahead of time uh, can have an idea of you know what this new uh, facility or park uh, is going to look like and then you can provide uh, feedback. I have smart growth here so again you can as the planner you can be working with the developer um, sharing data so the developer says well we'd like to build this. Um, you as the uh, uh, the planner, you can say, well, we've got these environmental uh, concerns or restrictions. So again, it makes working together with uh, other people um, uh, easier. I've got uh, another example, emergency preparedness. So where are the best places to put um, uh, shelters in case there is something like flooding? If there was a, a, a flood uh, in Vancouver, there was a hundred year rain that never you know happens only well once every hundred years say okay well what areas are going to get flooded well we don't want emergency shelters to be flooded so what we can we can model those scenarios where is the water going to flood and they say okay well let's let's put our um facilities or emergency preparedness shelters in these locations because they're higher than where we think that flood is going to be um, a few other things, sight lines, if you're going to be putting up, say developers are going to be putting up um, skyscrapers, they want to make sure the, the, uh, the planners, that the people with, with houses nearby, say, aren't going to be living in perpetual um, shade. So again, um, lots of things that you can do. And, and I think this is my last example, or, well, I've got one more example after this, geologists. So, um, People in the mining sector use this a lot. They can um, plan ahead of time. So in the winter, before they have to go out and do their exploration, they can build some maps to figure out how they are uh, going to explore uh, an area. They can um, download data from, say, a provincial or federal government that might have some existing geological information um, or assay data that maybe the government has done for sampling um, streams so that people can find out what kinds of um, elements like gold or silver that have might have been detected uh, in those stream sediments. So um, you can sort of help figure out as the geologist, you know, where should I go in my field season? Then once you're out there and you're doing your sampling, you can record that uh, on say your handheld device, bring all that information back uh, at the end of the season and sort of continue doing your analysis. So it can really help uh, help out in all stages for um, uh, geological exploration and uh, mine development. And I think this is my last one here. So retail, again, I'm trying to show you lots of different applications. So uh, for retails, you know, all different kinds of, of companies like you could say Starbucks, or I showed you the McDonald's, Chipotle, they are going to figure out, you know, what site, you know, where am I going to put in my new Chipotle or my new um, McDonald's? So one of the things you might do is look at, you know, where's my competitor sites? You might also look at things such as how far are people willing to walk or to drive to go to my store? So with GIS, you can do things like calculate walk times or drive times from certain locations. Um, as well as you can do things that's called customer profiling. So we can do things like get um, census data from say the uh, uh, Canadian government and uh, we can plot that information uh, on a map and we can say, okay, well, uh, if I was say a, um, a coffee shop um, like Starbucks, I say, okay, well, tell me, let's see, what, um, what kind of people go to this particular Starbucks in Burnaby? Using the census data, I can find out, well, maybe it's 20 to 24-year-old um, single males and females that go uh, to that one mainly. Say, okay, well, um, maybe I want to uh, find other places within Burnaby or maybe across Vancouver or 
across BC that have that same demographic profile and then go to Starbucks in those locations. So lots of cool things, again, that you can do with GIS, different kinds of applications. Okay, so let's get into some of the GIS careers that there are. And I'm just gonna break it into three main categories, users, builders, and managers. So I'll talk about users first. So the users, um, they're, they're basically the end user of GIS. They don't really have to understand how GIS works. They don't need to know the difference between raster or vector data. They don't need to know what a, a buffer or drive time analysis is. Um, usually what happens is they could be, say, a, 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 it's like I have your example, a municipal counter clerk. It could be a person working at a front desk and somebody says, uh, comes up and says, well, I need uh, a map that shows me what my my legal boundary is for um, my house. Um, so that person could have a customized screen that somebody like me or Sheila would put together in the GIS. So make a custom screen. So all that user, say the, the counter clerk has to do is enter in that person's address, maybe click a few buttons that configure what the map is going to look like and you know, there's the result. So they don't have to have lots of knowledge. So um, users are who you could be building applications for. Now builders um, are what we are at BCIT creating uh, through our program. So we're giving you uh, all those technical skills, uh, lots of hands-on work so that um, you know how to build, say, a mobile app or you know how to work with satellite imagery, you know, know, know how to build a spatial database that we can then link up to uh, a web map. Lots of um, important things that need to be done in order to make it look easy for, say, the users and for the managers. So let's look at the managers. Well, managers are usually going to be um, builders, or they had started off, say, as a GIS technician, um, one, and over whatever, six years or, or so, depending on where they work, they've gained experience, and then they become a manager. So they could just be working, you know, manage a small team, so um, sort of a small project manager, or they could uh, manage an entire, say, branch. So the managers um, not, aren't necessarily doing lots of hands-on work, but they can guide work. So they have the knowledge and expertise. So if builders run into problems, um, they can help them out, give them some guidance, um, help manage projects, uh, because the builders wouldn't have that kind of, uh, that kind of knowledge yet. So um, you're going to start off, uh, hopefully, as builders after you go through our program, and then over time you will be working your way up as a, a manager. So what kind of skills are, are you going to learn? I was mentioning some of these things. Um, first off is you're going to be, you know, learning to use GIS software. So the most, probably the most popular software in North America, if not the world, uh, is the ArcGIS software. Uh, it's made by ESRI, uh, which is located in in California and uh, again it's it's everywhere all again all different levels of government are using it as well as uh, private companies as well so it's good to have that uh, that experience uh, we're also going to teach you about um, how to build databases how to load in things like satellite images or you have um, your digital map your vector maps how to get that in how to load those data sets in, how to make sure that they're clean and good and ready to go to use uh, in the GIS. Uh, once that data is in, you say, okay, well, you know, what kinds of things, what kind of analysis can I do? So we will teach you how to um, problem solve uh, with GIS. We'll uh, say that scenario, uh, if there was a hundred year flood uh, in Vancouver, so what kinds of GIS functions would you need to do? What kinds of data sets 
uh, would you need to use? So we'll teach you um, those types of things. So uh, different types of GIS analysis so, you, so that you're ready um, when you go out um, uh, with your jobs. We'll also teach you a little bit of cartography. So um, just making, knowing how to make um, maps or do analysis with GIS is important, but if you can't get the information across, if you don't know how to make a map that people can easily understand, um, then that GIS analysis might not be uh, appreciated or there, you might give the wrong, um, uh, the wrong information. To people, so uh, we do provide you with some um, cartographic um, background, uh, a little bit of surveying as well. Um, survey people work closely with GIS people. There are primary data collectors, so you might need to build a data collection app, say for a surveyor or somebody else that's going to go out in the field uh, and collect data. So you need to know a little bit about about surveying. And the last thing I have here is on, on remote sensing. So remote sensing is basically um, collecting data uh, without touching it. So uh, things like digital photography, digital cameras, satellite images uh, would also be viewed as remote sensing. And now you might have heard of things such as LIDAR or, or drones, UAVs. Those are all different um, tools and technologies that we use for collecting um, data, usually image type data uh, remotely. Okay, um, what kinds of jobs? So again, uh, trying to give you very concrete examples uh, of jobs here. So um, I updated these slides just uh, last month. So I went to a few different websites and I just typed in either the word GIS or GIS technician to see what came out. So on the left, uh, the web page there is it's civicinfo.bc.ca. So that's a, um, a website for typically um, government jobs in BC, although they do cover jobs from other provinces as well. So uh, when I did a search for GIS jobs um, in April, two, two popped up. One was a, a GIS coordinator uh, at the Regional District of East Kootenai, and the other was this is uh, an application and GIS services supervisor for the city of West Kelowna. So again, GIS is, it's not just in big cities, so you're not just going to find it in, say, in Vancouver or Toronto. Uh, it could also be, you know, in smaller cities and towns, such as the city of West Kelowna uh, in the interior here in BC. Okay, so I, I then went to another website called wowjobs.ca and you can see I typed in the keyword GIS technician and I said just look in British Columbia and um, it found 18 uh, jobs. Uh, I don't have all 18 here showing in, in my screen capture, uh, but I've got one, two, three, four, five showing. So the first one is a GIS technician job at the city of uh, Chilliwack, there's a drafting group manager, Clone Crib and Berger, they're uh, a big engineering company. Uh, forestry technician, um, that looks like it's a, uh, a First Nations um, company or agency. Another one, GIS technicians with Eco4 uh, Consulting, and the last one says engineering assistant with the city of Prince George. Now, one of the things you say, well, you type in GIS technician as a keyword, but um, forestry technician, engineering assistant, doesn't say GIS technician. Well, that's true, but lots of these jobs make use of GIS and it'll be in the description. Okay, so forestry technician, if I were to click uh, on that one, it would, it would probably say something about making, having to make uh, maps using ArcGIS, the same thing uh, with that engineering system. Uh, assistant, we'll, we'll probably talk about the need for knowledge in CAD and uh, and GIS. So there's lots of jobs out there in GIS, but you have to sometimes take a look at things um, that don't necessarily say GIS in, in the title, but in the descriptions, it shows up. Okay, so there, again, this one, uh, wow jobs, it, there was 18 that were listed on that day that I looked uh, in April, and that was just for BC. 
Okay, so the technical skills for a GS uh, career. So uh, again, I sort of talked a little bit about this. So you, you are going to have skills in GIS, how to use it, um, how to do analysis, how to build databases, how to make, make good looking maps with cartography. You're also going to be doing programming. So in GIS now, uh, you need to have um, do some programming. Uh, we teach uh, a lot of Python uh, program, programming, uh, but you're also going to get a little bit of um, C, uh, Java, JavaScript, uh, PHP, some um, programming languages for, for the web. So programming is super important. Again, you don't need to be uh, necessarily the world's greatest programmer. Um, but just long as you can put together, um, say, a, a little script that you might need that, say, the ESRI software, ArcGIS software, can't do something. And you might need to add just a few little lines of code just to do exactly what you want it to do. So um, you don't have to be a super programmer, um, but we'll give you those skills so that um, you can add or enhance or create apps if you really do uh, like doing that stuff. Um, there's also CAD and remote sensing. So I mentioned in the previous slide uh, for the engineering company, they might be looking for CAD and GIS. So you will be learning um, how to use AutoCAD uh, as one of the courses that we will teach you. And then uh, again, web applications will show you how to build uh, websites. We'll teach you about sort of all the backgrounds, uh, background, how to set up web servers, things like that. So there's a lot of technical stuff that, uh, in GIS that goes on in the background that say end users don't see, but are sort of really important uh, for you um, if you want to have be the person with those GIS technical skills. Now we also have um, soft skills that you are going to uh, learn or things that are important. Uh, you will be working um, sort of on your own on assignments, but as, as well as we do have assignments in, in the courses where you're gonna to work together with say one or two or more uh, people to put together a presentation or do some sort of analysis. So um, being able to problem solve on your own in, in groups, being able to work on your own in groups, being able to communicate, you'll be doing a fair number of presentations, um, just you know, improving your interpersonal skills, uh, as well as, you know, GIS helps um, or creative people, like you're making maps. Maps are a science, because they have a science and an art. So you could put your own stamp on, on how a map looks, just by the colors you use and fonts and things like that. Um, as well as our program is, uh, in the full-time program, we uh, have lots of courses. We have got lots of work for you to do. So you learn how to be a very organized person. And uh, let's uh, look at, you know, how, how fast can I get a job or how uh, on average and what kind of salary could I be looking at with a GIS career? Well, we did a uh, survey of our 2010 and, and 2011 BCIT graduates, and uh, on on uh, once on the left hand side here, we see the time to obtain uh, a GIS job. So you see the blue it says before graduating, twenty eight percent. Well, how is that possible? Well, what happens uh, in our program is that uh, in our winter and spring terms, all of our students have a sponsor that they're going to do some work for. Uh, it's either called a practicum, where they actually go to the sponsor's office and work as they, as if they were an employee, um, or a project where you do the work for that sponsor, but you do it, um, say, at BCIT on campus. So these sponsors will get to know you ahead of time, so they'll they'll have some familiarity with you, and like I said, twenty eight percent of the graduates. Um, were hired before they finished graduating and um, probably most of those were because that was the sponsor. The sponsor liked them. Okay, uh, the next group there uh, in red said less than three months, about 28%. Uh, so again, um, depending on how ambitious you are as soon as you get out uh, after uh, going through the program, again, um, 
28% uh, uh, had a job within three months. Uh, between four and six months, uh, another 28%. And then uh, within a year, we had that remaining eight. And there was 8% that took longer. So why would why was there, there be 8% there? Well, what happens is some of the students that come to do our program, they want to go and do another degree after. So we had we we do have students that go and they go to do a master's degree uh, after they come and uh, get say our bachelor uh, of technology. Uh, on the uh, right hand side, we have the starting salary. So again, the biggest uh, slice of the pie is that green uh, slice on the left. So forty percent when they start off. So just you know, coming straight out zero experience between 50 and 59,000 uh, dollars. Um, the next biggest slice, uh, the red one to the right, 32% uh, between 40 and 49,000, uh, and then 20% less than uh, 40,000. So again, the majority, so almost 75% were between 40 to 59,000 uh, dollars, and that was nine, 10 years ago. Well, what's happening now? Well, what I did is I went to payscale.com um, and I looked for GIS um, technicians, analysts, and uh, managers in Canada. And what is the, um, um, the pay scale range for people within Canada so that uh, I'm not looking or comparing people in Europe or US or South America. I'm just looking at uh, the Canadian money. So the first one we have here is GIS technician. So up to one year of experience, we can see the median um, income is fifty-one thousand dollars, with a range between thirty-eight uh, to sixty-five thousand dollars. Now, again, depending on where you live, so if you're maybe in a uh, a smaller town or rural area, um, you might not be close to that. They might not giving you close to that $65,000 range uh, to start off. But say if you're in Vancouver, where the cost of living is higher, um, you'd expect um, your, your um, wage, your income, is going to be um, sort of above that median range. So let's take a look at uh, our next one. That's the GIS analyst. So that's somebody that has four years of GIS experience. So you can see uh, the median has moved up. So the median is now 56,000. Um, and um, that, that uh, the, the min-max range has, has gone up as well. So 45,000 uh, to 68,000. Okay, and again, depending on where you live, um, you're going to be sliding somewhere in that scale. And then what if you uh, become a manager? So a manager, they classify from pay scale as somebody with um, at least six years of experience. And you can see the median has jumped up quite a bit. It's at uh, 78,000 uh, with the range between 58 and $100,000. Okay, so you can see that uh, the money does increase as we do get um, um, sort of higher up uh, on, on uh, sort of the GIS um, knowledge scale and experience scale. Okay, now let's take a look at, at you know, what does BCIT have to offer? Okay, well, we've been around, um, uh, the program has been around since 1987. It started and, and it's slowly evolved and, and built up. We have hundreds of successful graduates. The great thing about that is uh, the people that have graduated, um, they are now, you know, managers of departments uh, or senior GIS technicians uh, and a lot of them uh, will look for BCIT GIS graduates and they actually send job ads over to our department and say can you please send that uh, uh, to sort of the recent graduates and the alumni because we know that you know what what uh, we've learned uh, and how helpful and useful it is so that uh, that's the kind of people that, that we want to hire. So um, our program just keeps getting stronger and stronger because um, our students keep getting hired by um, our past graduates. So we have a very good reputation, uh, both within Canada uh, and, and around the world. People know about us 
Uh, we have lots of international students that uh, want to come into our program as well. Um, our courses, so we do have uh, our full-time uh, program. So in a full-time program, we have our advanced diploma and our Bachelor of Technology. Uh, and that's done face-to-face -face, um, at the BCIT Burnaby campus. Uh, we also have our part-time studies courses. Uh, most of those are online. We do have uh, a few face-to-face -face courses uh, each semester. Um, uh, and for part-time studies, we again have the same courses for the advanced diploma and the Bachelor of Technology. So uh, say if you can't come to do the, the full-time program, um, but you are able to do it through part-time studies, you can get your advanced diploma or your Bachelor of Technology uh, online. The other one that we have here that I haven't mentioned is what's called the advanced certificate. That one is only offered uh, through part-time studies, so it's only uh, online. So we'll, we'll get into these three programs here in a second. Uh, and I talked uh, about these here already. So the part-time, uh, most of it is is online. Again, there's few that could be uh, campus-based. Um, usually it's sort of a, a compressed one-week course. You come in Monday to Friday and um, you finish one of our, our courses, such as the uh, introduction to ArcGIS. Okay. Uh, some of you might not um, yet know, well, do I really want to go 100% you know, as GIS? So you can take our 7,000 level courses uh, for general interest and see, okay, well, maybe I want to take the ArcGIS uh, level one course, or maybe sort of the introduction to uh, database or programming. See if that's something that I like. So it could go, you know, just as a general interest. And then if you really like it, then you can go into sort of becoming a, a full-time student. Um, it can also be used for professional development. So I mentioned engineers before. So uh, engineers as part of their ongoing, keeping their accreditation as being a, a PNG, um, they need to take courses. So they can take um, our GIS courses and use that as part of their, their, their ongoing professional development. Um, let's take a look here at the advanced certificate. So the advanced certificate is for somebody such as that engineer that I just, uh, I just mentioned. So you might be happy as an engineer or say as a forester, but you would like to have a little bit of GIS experience because maybe um, there is an, uh, a GIS department and you're always needing to interact with them and you'd like to be able to talk to them better and understand what they're doing and um, having um, some a few GIS courses under your belt uh, which you get with the advanced certificate can help you out there. So it is seven courses, it's all online. Um, if you want, if you're sort of really dedicated you can get those seven courses done in a year and a half. So again, um, it's something like you're doing it on your evenings and weekends because you do have a full-time job, say as an, in, in, as an engineer or a forester, um, or you can take up to five years. The other nice thing about the advanced certificate is that once you take those, you say, well, you know, I, I just wanted to get my feet wet to see if GIS was something that was really interesting to me. And now I really do like it and I want to go into the advanced diploma or I want to get my bachelor's degree you can, we call ladder. So you can use some of the courses from the advanced certificate to bring you into um, the bachelor degree or the advanced diploma. So the advanced diploma um, is when you want to have a full-time career as a GIS person. Now, most of the people that come into our program already have, say, uh, a degree, say, from UBC, or SFU, they could have been in geography, they could have been in, in sociology, um, they could have been in business, uh, and they come because they want those, that hands-on experience. Uh, we also have what we call our Bachelor of Technology. So these are for people that don't have, say, a, a BSc or a BA. They might just have an associate degree, or they had taken a bunch of uh, courses at, at uh, university, but they just haven't finished off that degree. 
So um, you can get your bachelor's degree, Bachelor of Technology, with BCIT uh, in the GIS program. And other people that uh, I, we found that uh, would like a Bachelor of Technology are um, uh, international students that they might have a bachelor's degree from um, their home country. But um, Canadian or Canadian and US um, bachelor's uh, degree credentials typically have sort of a sort of a higher view as being better, whether um, they are or not is, is, uh, is another question. But um, lots of people view North American degrees as being uh, sort of a uh, sort of a higher higher level of degree, so we do have a lot of international uh, students getting their bachelor of technology with us. Okay, so entrance requirements for all three of our programs is identical. So typically, I said again, most people have already a degree from university or college, so um, they can go into a program. Um, others might not have completed, say, a full BSc, so they might have associate degree or two years of um, university studies um, with, with, and those are with advanced uh, level courses, not all just intro uh, level courses. Or they could have come from, say, uh, another program at BCIT, or they could have come from Nate or SAIT, for example, uh, from uh, in Alberta. So if you have a diploma of technology from some other technical um, college, you can use that uh, to get into uh, one of our programs. So um, sort of like what are the courses that, that, that uh, we go through? I'm not going to list all of our courses, uh, but the way that it works, we'll look at the advanced diploma uh, here first on the left-hand side. So um, the numbers that are in brackets are, are credits. So uh, in the advanced diploma, we, te we teach you 45 credits of technical GIS. So that technical GIS includes things such as the database uh, as well as programming. Okay, so there's 45 credits. Uh, the advanced diploma is over a nine, nine to 10 months, depending on, on um, some project work or practica work that you do. Uh, our advanced diploma in the full time starts September every year and then it'll end in either May uh, or June. So over those nine to 10 months, you're going to take 45 credits of GIS technical courses. Um, you're also going to take um, at the same time, five credits of management uh, courses as it relates to GIS. And then you see below there, it says industry project or workplace practicum, that says uh, 12 credits there. So uh, again, what I uh, mentioned earlier, one of the reasons that students like to come to BCIT is they get um, lots of hands-on experience and they get to work with a sponsor. So they could work, say, as a practicum student with the city of uh, Burnaby Engineering Department, or they could work um, for a, uh, a, a private company, say an engineering company, such as McElhaney or Kerwood Lytle, okay, or an environmental company. Uh, so they're they're going to to do either a project where you do the project is you do the work um, for the sponsor um, on campus. So at BCIT, the practicum is you go and you work in that sponsor's office as if you were like an employee. So after that nine or ten month uh, work uh, that you do with us, you would get your advanced diploma. Now let's look at the Bachelor of Technology. So you'll see that the technical courses are the same, 45 credits. Uh, you'll see the management courses are a little bit uh, more. There's nine credits versus five. Uh, as well as if you look below the management courses, there's something called liberal arts courses of 12, uh, 12 credits. So after you finish those uh, technical courses and um, you do your industry project, so uh, the difference between a bachelor of technology and advanced diploma. The advanced diploma students can do a project or a practicum. Uh, if you're doing a bachelor, you have to do uh, a project, but it's still with a sponsor, okay? So you're still getting that experience of, of doing some work uh, for a sponsor. But after you finish your technical courses, um, your five initial management courses and your project, um, 
you're basically, uh, you're almost at the same, the same spot as the ADP, advanced diploma students are, but what you now have to do is you need to, to pick up four more credits of management courses. Uh, you need to get 12 liberal arts credit courses. So you can do those through part-time uh, studies. And the other one is there, if you look in the bottom left-hand corner uh, to the industry project, six months of GIS work experience. Okay, so um, you would then go and um, find some place uh, to get uh, some GIS work experience. Now, it could be a paid position, like you might go and uh, find a job with, uh, you know, ABC Environmental Company and work there and gain your experience. And after you do, you get your six months of GIS work experience, you then uh, apply for your BTEC credential. But it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a company that you work for. You could also get um, the GS work experience through volunteering to say a non-governmental uh, organization. So if you wanted to do some work for World Wildlife Fund or um, some other um, NGO, you could get the experience there. So it doesn't necessarily have to be all paid experience. It can be experience through volunteering uh, as well. So let's move on here now. Okay, so I, I, I mentioned here for the advanced diploma. So again, face-to-face, -face, if you're here for the full-time program, uh, it's nine to 10 months starting every September. Uh, there, again, you can do the advanced diploma online, 100%, uh, if you want. Uh, theoretically, if you totally dedicate yourself um, you can you can uh, get through the program in two years, but it's very hard. Lots of people, if they're doing part-time version, they have a job or they've got children, things like that, family to worry about. So uh, through the part-time studies, we allow you to do or, or, or complete the advanced diploma within five years. Uh, the BTEC, uh, so the BTEC, again, it starts uh, in the full-time face-to-face Every September, just like the advanced diploma, uh, you finish all of your GIS technical, technical courses in those nine or 10 months. Uh, and then you take those uh, extra courses as well as take your um, GIS work experience. So again, um, the GIS work experience and those extra credits in, in uh, management and liberal uh, arts, um, those you do through part-time studies. Or again, you can do the Bachelor of Technology 100% online through part-time studies. So again, if you super dedicate yourself, you could get it done in three years. Or again, if you've got family and job and things to worry about, um, you have up to seven years to get your BTEC. So what kinds of facilities do we have uh, if you come to BCIT to do the face-to-face? So uh, we do have labs that are dedicated uh, for GI students. You need a swipe card to, to get into, uh, uh, into the lab. Um, some of the labs we have 24 uh, hours a day, seven days a week access uh, so that you can do your work. But um, now again, lots of people, they have good high speed internet. They've got laptops or desktops at home. So they don't necessarily have to be hanging around uh, at BC, BCIT campus at 1 or 2 a.m. Uh, working. You could be working at 1 or 2 a.m. Uh, on, your, on your GIS assignments uh, from home. But we still have all of these things here. So during the day, um, you can be working with um, our hardware and software. Um, if you're doing it online, say um, the ArcGIS software and the other software that we use, uh, we have that hosted at BCIT, so you do not have to install ArcGIS or you do not have to install a database server uh, or, or a web server uh, on your laptop or on your desktop. So we have that. Um, all you need is a good internet connection and a web browser and uh, either one really nice big monitor or two monitors side by side um, so that you can then. Um, access through a web interface. So when you come on campus, again, we have small class sizes. So in the program, we only accept 45 students a year. And then for our labs, we break those 45 students down into three groups of 15. So you have this, this 
little group of 15 that you're always working with. So you can sort of bounce ideas and talk to each other and, and learn from each other, as well as, you know, we're here the, as the instructors to help you. Okay, ah, I thought I'd give you a few examples of, um, say, some student practicas or projects. So we had one student here that uh, uh, they did a practicum with the District of Mission. So Mission is sort of in, in uh, um, sort of the, if you go up in the Fraser Valley, uh, you'll come to the District of Mission. So uh, what this student was doing was creating web maps for the District of Mission's public website. So the student shows uh, some examples of the different types of maps that they created. They talked about what the technology that they used um, so one of the things that we do get the students to do is build a poster. That's one of their uh, one of their assignments as part of doing their practica. Okay, so let's look at another one I've got here. Uh, so this is completely different. So this student did a practicum with the BC Center for Disease Control. So again, you could think of COVID nineteen. There could be a project or a practicum that you could be doing with the BC CDC on uh, COVID-19 in BC or whatever province or, or country that you're working with. So, so here for this example, this student was looking at uh, or helping uh, the BC CDC look at um, immunization um, coverage for two-year-old uh, children across BC. Um, so um, finding the locations of where all these two-year-old children are, um, what health district do they, they fall in and um, say per 1,000 children or per 10,000, you know, how many of those children have immunization. So there's all kinds of cool things that we do in our projects and practica. So we also have other practica. Lots of students go and say work for a municipality. So there's usually say the city of Burnaby or the, uh, the city of Surrey uh, will hire. Uh, the example of the, the business example that I had for you with Tetrad. Tetrad usually hires um, students for projects or practica. Uh, we have, say, um, CBRE, which is a big commercial retail, real estate uh, company. They uh, bring on students every year for projects and or practica. There's all kinds of things. Um, um, yeah. So let's, uh, let's keep going here. What's my next thing here? Ah, so before you decide, like I said, you might be taking or, or listening to me and wondering, you know, sort of what is GIS? What kind of things do you do? Um, so before you decide that, uh, you know, do I want you to, to do uh, GIS? You know, take a you know, more look, do some research, see what kinds of industries, people that are using it. Maybe talk to some people. Um, go online and, and check out uh, the city that uh, wherever you're living, look for their engineering or their planning departments and, and, and see if there's a, a, a GIS person there and have a chat with them. Okay, you can take a look at job opportunities. Go to the, that, that uh, WOW Jobs uh, website and type in GIS technician and uh, say the city or province or, or, or yeah, city or province because that's a Canadian website. Um, uh, to see what jobs that there are currently. So give you some ideas. Um, and um, from that, you know, just looking around, talking with people, um, is it something I'm interested in? I think it's really cool. We always get to play with maps. I can't, uh, you know, I'm not a person that uh, likes to be looking at tables of, of numbers all the time, maps and satellite images and, and things like that are always uh, sort of visually stimulating and interesting. Um, also here at the very bottom, I have readiness or technical skills. Uh, you might not say, well, I've, I, you know, I've never done programming before. Well, there's lots of sort of free courses out there on the web. And I mentioned that we do a lot of Python programming. Why not try and take one of those free, um, intro to Python courses and see, you know, you know how did I do? Cause that'll help you when you then do the Python, um, programming with us. And the last, all of our courses are, are, are taught in, in English, uh, as well as like we need to do writing reports and, and your assignments uh, that has to be in English. So, you know, make sure if you're not strong in English, it could be a, a bit of an issue to you. So you might need to 
or, or want to be, you know, brush up, uh, take some um, English reading and writing skills. If you say you are an international student that's watching the presentation here today. Okay, and if you have any other um, questions, um, sort of admission wise, um, you can email this program underscore advising at bcit.ca uh, and somebody from from uh, admissions advising will contact you. Uh, if you're sort of sort of living in this time zone area, uh, you can phone uh, that 604-434-1610 number Monday to Friday. Um, they do have a drop in, although I don't think with the COVID-19, I don't know if you can actually come in uh, on campus. So probably do the phone or the email if you have some admissions uh, type questions. Um, if you have sort of more technical kinds of questions, things that you might be learning, or you, um, you've got some ideas of who you might want to say work as, have a, as your sponsor, if you wanted to do uh, your BTEC or your ADP with us, you could talk to, to me. Uh, I've got my contact uh, phone number or email. I'm always checking my email uh, seven days a week. So um, I, I try to respond as soon as possible. You can check out, again, our website. If you haven't uh, uh, looked too, too uh, much in depth in our website, it lists all of our courses, course descriptions and things there. Uh, if you wanted to sort of investigate the part-time studies route, um, you can talk to our part-time studies coordinator. Uh, her name's Carmen Heaver. So again, there's her phone number and her uh, email address. And then other, um, questions that may or may not fall into what uh, uh, Carmen or I uh, can answer. If you might have some general questions, you could email uh, D. Marita, our program assistant. The best is to email gis at bcit.ca. Uh, D. might have the answer. If she doesn't, she'll probably forward it to either Carmen or me to uh, answer to you. And that's it for my presentation. So I think what I will do now is I will uh, unmute people. So if you have uh, a question, you can um, just ask it out loud and um, I will uh, try to answer as best I can. Hello, I have a question. Yes. Which level of English uh, is required for a Bachelor of GIS? Well, uh, that's sort of one of the BCIT admissions questions. Now they have, they have these ICES uh, um, uh, accreditation or evaluation that uh, all international students uh, go through. And um, there's a certain level of ICES accreditation that you need to pass in order to be uh, able to take um, the GIS program or any program at BCIT. So um, I would ask, I would talk to um, that advising um, through that advising email address that I had put up earlier. I don't, I don't personally have that, um, that kind of information. Um, I have a quick question. Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about the time commitment for the full-time program? I know sometimes when programs are full-time, yes. um, you know, that might mean one three hour class a day, every day a week. And then some programs that are full time are quite clearly nine to five, five days a week with extra study time. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Well, yeah, our, our program in the full time fits into the latter category. Um, our cor our, our um, courses um, typically start or, or whether, whether it's a lecture or lab will start usually at 830. Uh, in the morning and go till could be 3.30 or 4.30 for most days. Now I mentioned that we have our, our sets, uh, we've got 45 students and we break them up into three sets of 15. So each set has a slightly different um, calendar or timetable. So um, you might start off at 8.30 one day and end at 2.30 and another set would start at 9.30 and go till 4.30. But in general, from Monday to Friday, it's usually between like 8.30 to 4.30 is when we do sort of our lectures and labs. 
and then you still have to spend time you know working on assignments uh on your own time reading like we have uh readings that you, there might be uh for a course um uh, as well as you know you're just your general studying getting re ready for quizzes and exams things like that so it's it's pretty uh you have to be pretty dedicated in in the full-time program excuse me i have another question okay yep you mentioned different conduct for example engineer can apply for uh, arcgis but uh, what about the civil engineer because i have a back uh, from, field from civil engineer so i want to know that the arcgis works for me or no because i'm so interested in gis but i'm not sure that it works for me or not Oh, yeah, no, definitely um, with civil engineering and ArcGIS, that, that works together, yes. Hello. Thank you. Uh, hello. Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, I have a question. Um, I have a couple of questions, actually. I'm just wondering, um, do, you, do you know what the limitations of the, this GIS program is compared to, like, a master's in geography where they utilize GIS or, um, like, remote sensing? Well, it, in, it, uh, in the university courses, uh, say if you're doing a bachelor or, master or a master's, um, you do get some um, use or using you know, the ArcGIS or, or some other software, but it's not going to be to the same extent of hands-on experience that you're going to get uh, with us. Each one of our courses, every week, you're going to have an assignment uh, with Sheila, with us, say, with ArcGIS, uh, and with me, with the sort of fundamentals of GIS, and with uh, another one of our instructors with building database. So you're going to get probably an order of magnitude more hands-on experience in using GIS to solve problems uh, in our program than if you went to a university. Okay, thank you. Um, I also have an, another question. Um, I've noticed that a lot of people nowadays are saying that GIS is more of a tool rather than um, something you can study and anyone can learn it. Do you know if, um, do you see any sort of demand, like a decrease in demand in um, the uh, GIS degrees or so on? No, I see GIS, like our program, um, we take 45 uh, students a year. As soon as we open up our registration, so um, our registration uh, for this, for September next year, so not for this September, but for September next year. So our registration will open in October um, and we will have our 45 students filled within two, with two months maximum, usually within the first month all of it's filled it's like that every year that's that's how many people are, are looking uh for gis and full-time and in part-time studies you know it's it's sort of a it's a continual intake one of the nice things with part-time studies is you don't have to start in september you don't have to start in the fall semester you could start taking courses in january that's our winter start or you could start taking courses uh in uh in april which is our spring semester so that's a nice thing. If you if you go through and do part time studies, um, you can start basically, you know, at three different points uh, in the year. While in the full time, um, it's always September, and there's that forty five person limit. In part time studies, um, you can register. Register. We don't say there's only. We only allow forty five part time students uh, into the GIS program. Okay. Thank you. Oh, Hello. And we're, okay, Alexa can talk. Hi. Um, Hello. I'm working, I'm currently working at Bombardier Aerospace. I'm a full time mm -hmm. worker there. Yep. And I'm just interested in the bachelor's degree, but I just wanted to know how does GIS and aerospace kind of go hand in hand? Because they do have jobs there and everything. I just wanted to see what was your view on it. Um, interesting topic. Sorry. It's like a kind of a. Well, we do have, like, I, I used to, to work at McDonald Detweiler was one of the places, and they had the, the air traffic control uh, yes, software 
uh, again, which, which has a geospatial uh, component in there. So managing where all these, where, where planes are flying, you don't want planes to crash into, uh, into each other and managing airspace and things like that, uh, sort of related to, to the aerospace. Um, you can think of smaller things like all these UAVs and drones. Um, and those are all uh, make use of GIS technology to help guide, say, their flight paths and things, as well as the data that is collected by them, where you need to collect data so that um, you can build a geospatial model so that these drones, you know, know where to fly. Yes. So, well, hope, hopefully that gives you some ideas. Like, I, I don't work for an airline, so I can't get to sort yeah. of in-depth. Uh, oh, also for um, airport authorities. Uh, we do have, say, at the YVR airport here, we do have one of our GIS graduates is working there, and they're doing things such as mapping out the interior of the airport. Where are all the defibrillators located in case somebody gets a heart attack or something like that? So, you know, well, there's another example. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, again, if you have questions in the future, you can always email uh, me again for either full-time or part-time stuff you can again for part-time stuff you can also um, email Carmen and then if you might have maybe a little general question that you don't know whether Carmen or I sh would handle it you can always email D remember that was the GIS at BCIT uh, dot CA and again if it's questions related to um, how do you know getting into the program admissions kind of stuff um, you need to talk to uh, the BCIT admissions department. Uh, again, this has been recorded. I'm going to try and hopefully um, um, fix up a little bit of uh, or do some editing on this so that uh, um, things run a little bit smoother and uh, we can get it posted online so uh, you can watch it uh, again. So um, thank you everybody for attending and I hope uh, that uh, we get to see you either in the full time or through part-time studies uh, at the BCIT GIS.